Next on Currents News, a surprise by Benedict XVI, the retired Pope leaving the Vatican for the first time in four years. Details on where he went are ahead. The decision to begin executing federal death row inmates again is facing strong opposition from national Catholic leaders. Mother Cabrini, the patron saint of immigrants, is still impacting the Brooklyn Diocese. That story is part of a special look back at memorable Currents news reports, including the volunteers who kept a much-loved Brooklyn tradition alive by lifting a four-ton tower into the sky. The news starts right now. Good evening, I'm Tamara Lane. Benedict XVI is back at his Vatican residence tonight after taking his first trip outside the Vatican's walls in four years. Word about the 92-year-old surprise move broke this morning. Melissa Butts is standing by in St. Peter's Square with the latest. Melissa? Yes, Tamara. Well, we learned that the Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI had escaped the Vatican. At 4.15 on Thursday evening, he left in a black Mercedes with tinted windows, going to where he used to spend his summers as Pope, Castel Gandolfo. There he went for about an hour and a half, meeting with staff, walking and praying the rosary in the gardens. Then he went on to the second part. He went to Roca di Papa. It was there he went to a Marian sanctuary to pray and meet with the local priest. And then he went on to the third part of his trip, Frascati. It was there that he had a meeting and had dinner with a local bishop. And this bishop was the one who sent the original invitation to get him out of the Vatican Gardens. He returned home safe and sound around 10.30 p.m. back to his monastery in Mater Ecclesia. The interesting thing is that the Vatican didn't send out any communication about this until around 11.30 a.m. Friday morning. There were no photos or videos to accompany this little excursion. We found it out from local secular Italian media. But at age 92, for the Pope Emeritus to accept this invitation and leave the Vatican Gardens shows that he's definitely in good spirits, or at least he wanted to escape the Roman heat, both of which are very good signs. At the Vatican, Melissa Butts, Currents News. Pope Francis has made the fate of migrants a top priority. And tonight, Jesuits in Rome are demanding urgent action after a deadly shipwreck. As many as 150 migrants are feared to have drowned in the worst disaster in the Mediterranean this year. Around 300 people were on the dangerous sea crossing from Libya to Italy when the boat sank. The Jesuit Refugee Service is calling for new international plans to avoid further loss. Cardinal Jamie Ortega, the retired Archbishop of Havana, has returned to the Lord. The longtime voice of Cuba's poor, Cardinal Ortega helped broker improved relations between the United States and his country. He also welcomed four papal visits to the island, the most recent being Pope Francis in 2016. Cardinal Ortega was 82 years old. There is strong Catholic opposition tonight against the Trump administration's decision to resume the execution of prison inmates, with five men on death row now set to receive the ultimate punishment. Catholic leaders are voicing concern after Attorney General William Barr announced Thursday that the federal government will resume using the death penalty. The order quickly came under fire from national Catholic prelates, with Bishop Frank Duane, Chairman of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops Committee on Domestic Justice and Human Development, saying he is deeply concerned by the move, explaining, In 2015, Pope Francis, echoing the views of his predecessors, called for the global abolition of the death penalty. He went on to state, A just and necessary punishment must never exclude the dimension of hope and the goal of rehabilitation. And Catholic organizations agree. Chris Ann Valancourt Murphy, executive director of the Catholic Mobilizing Network Against the Death Penalty, responded to the announcement by saying, resuming federal executions, especially by an administration that identifies itself as pro-life, is wrong-headed and unconscionable. The Justice Department's declaration comes after a nearly two-decade hiatus of executions by the federal government, beginning with five death row inmates. 
that the Justice Department says are, quote, convicted of murdering and in some cases torturing and raping the most vulnerable in our society, children and the elderly. And though Catholic leaders and human rights advocates are urging the policy to be reconsidered, the White House is signaling Trump's full support for the change. The president's made very clear he wants stiffer penalties for high-level drug traffickers. We're actually hopeful that some legislation can be introduced and passed on a bipartisan basis. The Justice Department's announcement coming at a time when many states are distancing themselves from the death penalty, with statewide executions at an all-time low. Vape maker Juul is under fire from Congress on whether or not its marketing deliberately targeted kids. Internal documents revealed during an investigation showed schools were offered thousands of dollars to use a Juul-sponsored vaping prevention program. A company employee said the youth prevention efforts were, quote, eerily similar to those from Big Tobacco. Many experts want the FDA to regulate vaping devices. Congress is getting out of town. Today, the House is starting a recess that will last six weeks. Some things have been accomplished, but much is still left to be done. Omar Jimenez reports from Capitol Hill. It's been an action-packed week in Congress, and there's still a lot on the plate as the House breaks for the summer. One potential impeachment. We won't proceed when we have what we need to proceed. Not one day sooner. Then there's the budget, the House passing a two-year budget and debt limit deal that prevents automatic spending cuts to military and domestic funding, but crucially could add an extra $1.7 trillion to the national debt, according to the Committee for Responsible Federal Budgets. So there's no question that Congress and the executive branch at some point in time are going to have to deal with the deficit. Uh, I don't think anybody would argue that. The Senate is expected to vote on the bill next week. But one thing the Senate won't be taking up is a recently passed bill by the House on election security. It wasn't a single attempt. Uh, they're doing it as we sit here. Republicans calling the specific bill unrealistic. Clearly, this request is not a serious effort to make a law. Clearly, something so partisan that it only received one single solitary Republican vote in the House is not going to travel through the Senate by unanimous consent. It's a situation the Democrats hope to turn around by the time they return, in part because long-term deals on infrastructure and, significantly, immigration continue to hang in the balance. We will own August and make it too hot to handle for the Senate not to take up <laughs> our, our bills. In Washington, Omar Jimenez, Currents News. There's a lot more headed your way as we are highlighting some of our most memorable stories recently reported by the Currents News team. A new investigation is showing how the Notre Dame Inferno could have been worse, much worse. Nothing could stop this Brooklyn tradition from taking to the streets of Williamsburg. The Gilio lift is coming up. And he risked his life to serve his country. Now this devout Catholic's prayers are being answered. Tonight, we are highlighting some of the most memorable stories recently reported by our Currents News team. Three months after flames ripped through Paris's Notre Dame Cathedral, the New York Times is revealing that the iconic house of worship was far closer to collapsing than people originally thought. Currents News' Tim Harfman reports. What looked like a scene from a movie was a horrific reality in France. The Notre Dame Cathedral up in flames just days before Easter left Parisians and tourists alike in shock watching the 850-year-old church crumble. I, I just can't believe it. It's, it's just a, a whole part that's just missing. Now, three months after the disaster, the New York Times is uncovering just how close the cathedral came to collapsing entirely. According to the report, the employee monitoring the alarm system had been on the job just three days and was working a double shift. He was responsible for watching 160 alarms. When the emergency alert for the fire first came across, the employee notified a guard, but the guard went to the wrong location. According to the Times, it's unclear how much of the special alert the new employee even understood or conveyed to the guard. By the time the fire department was called, it had been 30 minutes since the first alarm went off. Officials said the blaze broke out in the attic, where there weren't any sprinklers or firewalls to preserve the architecture. <laughs> Nearly 50 firefighters pushed through the northern tower of the medieval structure, 
but they were ordered to evacuate, fearing the tower would collapse, taking the rest of the cathedral with it. Firefighters then climbed the southern tower instead and set up a platform between them. But the damage was done, leaving a gaping hole in the roof and a gaping hole in people's hearts. To see it go up like that, it's pretty devastating. According to the report, officials have yet to pinpoint the cause of the fire, but do know it wasn't criminal. They pledged to rebuild the historic cathedral. Tim Harfman, Currents News. Mother Cabrini holds a special place in the hearts of New Yorkers. She's the country's first citizen saint and a champion of immigrants. Her legacy endures to this very day, especially on the streets of Brooklyn, city blocks she once walked. So this is a relic of Mother Cabrini. So She was named patroness of uh, immigrants, and though she was seen by many as frail, Frances Xavier Cabrini dedicated her life to serving the less fortunate. Her mission, just as relevant today as it was when she first arrived on our shores, to serve marginalized immigrants. So like most Italian immigrants in the latter half of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s, she left there and landed here in New York back in uh, 1889. John Heyer is the parish archivist at Sacred Hearts St. Stephen. He has studied Mother Cabrini's impact on Brooklyn. We walked the streets where she started several of her first missions. This is Mother Cabrini Park right here, right where the church formerly stood at the Sacred Heart and next door to the convent uh, where sisters set up her, um, her nuns. So when, when she arrived here in Brooklyn, um, she arrived really in the parish boundaries of the Italian parish of the Sixth Ward, which was Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary. Serving immigrants who were mistreated, a main calling for the saint. Writing in a letter about the bishop, I could not refrain from telling him about all the things you are doing for our Italians at the St. Charles School, so uncharitably treated by the Protestants and by other sects. She felt a call and she was drawn to places where she heard immigrants were not being treated well. Sister Bernadette Anello is general counselor for the Missionary Sisters of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, an order Mother Cabrini established that today has a mission on almost every continent. From the global perspective, we're seeing this all over. Here in this country, when I hear them being called, they're drug traffickers, they're robbers, they're going to infest our country. This is the language that's used. And yet when we see the pictures, they are young families with little children who are fleeing crime. They will risk their lives and they'll leave behind everything to get to safe borders. And though immigration demographics have shifted, this missionary heart is enshrined in Brooklyn, the Diocese of Immigrants. Sister Bernadette, who is from Brooklyn, remembers the deep impact this humanitarian outreach had on her growing up. I mean, I remember this as a little girl. The sisters stopped. It took forever to get home because they had to walk about eight blocks from the school to the convent. They stopped along the way. They spoke to grandma. They spoke to a shop owner. They saw the children playing. They stopped to talk with them. Walking with John Heyer, we see a reminder of Mother Cabrini's work on nearly every corner. So this is a plaque and it outlines exactly the fact that Mother Cabrini lived and worked here in the parish and established the school. Her legacy is far-reaching, starting 67 missions. But even though she may be remembered for health care, she was hesitant to open hospitals. She felt health care was beyond her scope. She was by profession a teacher. She could work with orphan children. But a hospital? Originally declining an offer to start a hospital, she eventually accepted the calling after being urged by the Virgin Mary in a dream to take up the cause. Now, the Mother Cabrini Health Foundation is answering the same call. Announced by Cardinal Timothy Dolan in 2018, it aims to bridge the gap in the New York health care system by granting $150 million annually to organizations dedicated to serving disadvantaged and underserved populations. Mother Cabrini had a big impact on Brooklyn and New York. Can you explain that to me? Oh, absolutely. And Cardinal Dolan immediately said, because of his own love for Mother Cabrini, made the decision to name it after her. The Mother Cabrini Health Foundation, which is separate from the Cabrini Mission Foundation that has a global reach, is now the largest Catholic foundation in the U.S., with $3.2 billion in assets. Mother Cabrini, like all the saints, uh, they're universal. They belong to everybody. And 130 years after her arrival in New York City, Mother Cabrini's mission lives on.
Just a few days after I filed this report, New York's Cardinal Timothy Dolan celebrated Mother Cabrini's birthday at the St. Francis Cabrini Shrine in northern Manhattan, marking the 169th anniversary of the birth of America's first citizen saint. At the heart of the Italian-American experience in the Diocese of Brooklyn is the Giglio, a feast like you've probably never seen before. The highlight, a four-ton, seven-story tower that graces the Williamsburg skyline, lifted by manpower alone. But in order for that more than 100-year-old tradition to continue, Currents News' Tim Harfman reports volunteers were needed for the first time in history. And they answered the call with brute force. Tens of thousands of spectators filling the streets of Williamsburg, Brooklyn. It's Giglio Sunday, the highlight of the Our Lady of Mount Carmel feast. What is it like being here on Giglio Sunday? It's magic. It's absolute magic. Nothing in the world can pass this. Helping to make that magic, about 100 men under steel beams, lifting this seven-story, four-ton tower. At the top, a statue of St. Paulinus, an Italian saint. This 116-year-old tradition continues thanks in part to the parish's first ever recruitment drive. Monsignor Jamie Gigantiello, the church's pastor, says nearly 80 new lifters signed up. It not only ensured lifters for the future, but it got a lot of people's attention about the feast and also a lot of young people got involved in it that weren't. Sammy Kosiari is one of them. The 46-year-old grew up in Williamsburg and attended the feast as a child. Now a Long Island resident, he wanted to return to his roots and help a fast-changing neighborhood retain memories of the past. To be back, to, to lift, to have that opportunity, it's all I wanted. It's kind of like a, an aspiration to be a lifter one day. For others like John Durante, being part of the feast runs in the family. My father's been coming here, his father's been coming here over 111 years. Durante's been coming here and lifting his Julia. He's now sharing the experience with his children. John's seven-year-old son Joseph already has an understanding of the tradition. It celebrates saints and the church and how much you should love Jesus and how he sacrificed himself. These men consider lifting the Giglio a sacrifice of themselves, hoisting the structure as a penance for those who can't and as a way of remembering their deceased loved ones. Sammy's lifting in honor of his cousins. I feel like they're right here underneath the jail with me. Neil Delamonica helps to lead the lifters and says new members like Sammy will keep the tradition alive for another 116 years. It's nice to see some enthusiasm in it once again, and it's also nice to see that all these people want to be involved. They even let me get involved. In Williamsburg, Brooklyn, Tim Harfman, Currents News. Still to come on Currents News, as we are highlighting some of our most memorable stories recently reported by the Currents News team. A Catholic war hero is overwhelmed when one of his biggest wishes comes true. The enduring strength of Catholic education is highlighted when a final graduation is held. Welcome back to this special look at memorable stories recently reported by the Currents News team. Vietnam vet Michael Sassona, a devout Catholic, sacrificed a great deal serving his country. He lost both legs to a landmine. Now he has a new home built just for him. Currents News Tim Harfman is back with that report. Three, two, one. A brand new home for one of America's war heroes. Marine Sergeant Michael Sosona, a man so charismatic he's simply referred to as Mike, rolling his wheelchair into his house for the first time. You always appreciate what you have, you know, um, but this is like a bonus. Mike's old home wasn't wide enough for his wheelchair, and completing daily tasks were difficult. In this new Staten Island home, hallways are wider. The master bedroom and bathroom are on the first floor, and Mike won't have to struggle to reach a cabinet. This is all thanks to the Stephen Siller Tunnel to Towers Foundation, named in honor of the fallen September 11th responder who ran through the battery tunnel to save others. Stephen's brother Frank is the foundation's chairman and CEO. As St. Francis said, brothers and sisters, while we have time, let us do good. And today, this was very good. Mike was 19 when he stepped on a landmine in Vietnam. 
he had to have both legs oh amputated. For his bravery, Mike was awarded the Purple Heart and the Bronze Star with Valor. He and his wife, Frida, are Brooklyn natives. They grew up attending mass at St. Agnes and St. Paul churches in Carroll Gardens. Mike explains how his Catholic faith plays a role in life. In spirituality, you know, you're thankful for what you get and you're never going to lose by doing good to someone else. The 67-year-old is now an ambassador for Tunnel to Towers, reaching out to other vets and their families struggling to adjust after war. It's tough to get it together. I understand a lot of them um, just have uh, a tough time getting through life, but you know we got to pull it together. Pulling together to help the next generation of war heroes. In Staten Island, Tim Harfman, Currents News. The Tunnel to Towers Foundation is dedicated to helping veterans who have suffered severe combat injuries. To donate, go to their website, tunnel the number two towers.org. Finally tonight, school's out for summer, and as September speedily approaches, many students are preparing for the new year. But for one graduating class, saying goodbye this June was bittersweet. Their school's closing, making this year's eighth graders the last to receive their diploma. Currents News' Emily Druby reports they're getting support from the school's very first graduating class, illustrating the enduring strength of a Catholic education. Mary Queen of Heaven's Class of 2019 taking their first steps towards the future as a special group of people watched members of the very first class to ever graduate from the school. There is my diploma. Paula Whitney remembers her own commencement moment. She was part of that first graduation. I graduate on June 27, 1954. 65 years later, Whitney and some of her 90 classmates pictured here are back in these pews, this time to cheer on the school's last class. The Catholic Academy officially closing this summer, a decision made because of declining enrollment and severe budget deficits. The Academy has seen a 60% decline in attendance over just a five-year period. Alumni sad to see the school close. They've met up almost every year since graduation, enjoying bonds first established through their Catholic education. They gave us such a basis, and it's the spirit of Mary Queen of Heaven that is entwined between all of us that brings us back here all the time. Holding this year's reunion before and during the last graduation, as Tina Moore explains, to show the students the support the Alumni Network provides and will continue to provide. We're still behind them and uh, encouraging them. Students like Tracy Thompson thankful for the visit. Excited, honored, happy. <laughs> Those are the three emotions I could really use right now. While the pastor, Father Thomas Leach, says it shows that a Catholic education stays with students. They really love the parish, and so they, they've come back to celebrate with them. It's a very sad time, but at the same time, it's great to know that we've had that kind of effect on people's lives. Proving while this is the last class to graduate, the love, support, and faith fostered by Mary Queen of Heaven will always remain. In Flatlands, Emily Druby, Currents News. That is Currents News. I'm Tamara Lane. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.